Thanks. And with that, that leads us to our final session for today, which is our Databricks deep dive session on workflow jobs and the Databricks and GitHub integration. So our speakers are the same from the last session, Philip Pham from eSimplicity and Arif Kareem from Databricks. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Philip to kick things off for us. Thanks, Rachel. And hopefully we are familiar faces by now. So <laughs> in this session, I'm going to be going over uh, Git uh, Hub, uh, providing an overview of that and how it integrates into Databricks. And some areas that I'm going to be talking about is to first provide an overview of what GitHub is, uh, when it would, uh, when it would be relevant to use it in your Databricks workflows, how to create a GitHub token, and finally uh, integrating GitHub into Databricks and leveraging all of the features in Databricks for your Git flows to create branches, uh, pull requests, merging them and updating them within the platform. Arif is going to be closing us out today by going over Databricks workflows to specifically describe how one would create a job, uh, repairing the job and rerunning it, as well as going over job configurations and what monitoring would look like. So, um, Let's go to the next slide. For those of you who are not familiar, GitHub is a web-based version control and collaboration tool for developers. And the entire product is founded on the premise of Git, which is an open source code management system. So with Git, it allows you to track changes that you make to files so that you have uh, records of all of the changes uh, to your code and in your repo over time. And that also allows you to revert to specific versions of files, should you ever need to, if there was a bug or if there were uh, changes in direction with features and functionality. And lastly, with Git, uh, the tool allows um, for collaborations to be improved because it supports multiple users contributing to a single code base and uh, provides a process uh, for users to review each other's code, comment on them uh, before merging and deploying. So before moving on to GitHub Concepts, I wanna to touch on uh, what scenarios and when you would wanna use Git in Databricks. And this is important because Within Databricks, there's already native functionality that supports version controlling all of your notebooks. And to describe a little bit more about that architecture and infrastructure, all of your notebook codes today are backed by S3 buckets to prevent data loss. And Databricks also provides the capability to restore notebooks if you inadvertently delete them. So being able to restore them from your trash is also possible. Uh, similar to a Google Doc experience, as you are doing development in your notebooks, it will also autosave and uh, does similarly support reverting back to previous versions as well. And through uh, uh, your notebooks, you have the capability to share them with other members on your team. And if you have the ability to do so and are given privileges to do so, you can comment directly in those individual cells to provide your feedback. So with all that in mind, in what scenario would you use uh, repositories in Databricks? So a couple of instances come to mind. The first and the primary instance would be if you were setting up advanced Git automation using CI/CD workflows such as GitHub Actions uh, to be able to control deploying your code uh, on a merge event. So in that particular case, if you are operating uh, within GitHub, doing pull requests and merging, you can configure a GitHub action to essentially deploy it to a specific account to actually run in production. And that will give you the ability to schedule jobs that reference those particular notebooks in your Databricks repo uh, rather than in your account. And so, uh, for the remainder of the uh, for the demo, I'm going to be going over how to generate the token, how to integrate it within Databricks. This will apply if you already have existing access to GitHub. So um, on the next slide, 
before I go through the typical uh, GitHub workflow, I want to highlight and touch on some concepts that are going to be important for you to be aware of. The first is when it comes to your code base, your code is going to be stored within a GitHub repository, and it's going to contain all of your project files, all of your notebooks and SQL code, and also contain the entire revision history. Um, the repositories uh, can have multiple versions in the form of branches uh, for users to be able to do your development. And typically the stable production version uh, of a repository is always going to be the main or the master branch. For every single change that you make to your branch, those are going to be updated in your branch as commits. And a commit is essentially going to uh, a, a snapshot of the project with those newly specific, uh, the newly added changes. And the best practice here is that when you are committing a set of changes, always include a descriptive commit messages so that it can be referenced later. And then finally, with the branches that you are creating, uh, leveraging uh, a pull or merge request and adding reviewers from your team, uh, will allow for others within your team to provide feedback on that particular branch and give you an opportunity to incorporate those changes. So on the next slide, um, uh, the, uh, the picture illustrates a, a typical workflow where the production main branch, as you can see, is going to be in that middle master branch. And from that particular master branch, uh, you can create your own branch where you do your work towards the top, but someone else on your team can create their own branch as well on the bottom. And with this tip, with this specific flow, uh, multiple uh, users on your team can contribute to a single uh, code base by putting up pull requests, reviewing them, and then merging them at different times, as you can see as they merge back into the master branch. Okay. With that, uh, on the next slide, let's go ahead and move on to our demo. So I'm going to share my screen. OK. Uh, are you able to see my screen from here? Yes, we can. Excellent. So uh, I am in the GitHub page. And the very first thing that we're going to have to do in order to set up uh, the Databricks integration is to generate a GitHub token uh, so that Databricks can reach out to GitHub uh, under your user to be able to clone and make changes to your repository. So to be able to do that, you'll want to go to your settings. And then towards the bottom, you'll go to developer settings. And then here, you'll want to go to the personal access token menu. So specifically for Databricks, you will want to generate the classic token. And then here, when you generate that specific token, uh, you'll use the classic for general use. You'll give that token a name. So let's call this Databricks demo token. Um, it will default to 30 days. And at minimum, this token will need access to repo, uh, to your repo. So you'll need to ensure that you select that as a scope. And depending on how advanced your workflows are, if you are contributing to GitHub Action workflows, you may also need to select uh, uh, giving access to the workflows as well. But for this particular case, I'm just going to set it for repo. So towards the bottom, we'll generate the token. And then the token will appear. So I'm just going to save this over here, um, just temporarily. Let's just put it temporarily in a notebook, just put it right there. And then once you get back to uh, the GitHub page, what you'll need is to configure a single sign-on. And so with this particular token, you'll need to allow uh, it to authorize to the, to the group that you are associated with within CMS. So for me, that's just the CCSQ QDAS page. And it's gonna require me to log in again. So I'm going to uh, enter in my MFA. And 
And here, now the credential is authorized to access uh, that particular group and all the repositories associated with that group. So moving over to the Databricks side is where is where you'll need to configure that token that was saved earlier. And so I'm going to open up, um, I think I still have it copied, I do. So you'll wanna go to the Git integration page here. You wanna put in your Git provider username um, or, or email. So in that in this particular case, I'm gonna just put my email. And then yeah. here, is where you're gonna be pasting that specific GitHub personal access token that you generated earlier. Okay, so now that you have configured your tokens, uh, you can move on to cloning and adding a repository. So here at this point, I'm gonna go back to uh, my profile and pull up a sample uh, repository that I created, um, I don't know, it's private, called my repo. And within GitHub, I'm going to copy the HTTPS address for that repository. And then jumping back to Databricks is where I'm going to paste it. And then it's going to default to the repository name, uh, my-repo. And then um, if you have multiple uh, uh, tokens that are generated, you can also specify the Git credential that you want to use there. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and create that repo. And then if I go to this repo, you can see here that the only thing that's available now is a readme, right? So you can also see that when you uh, jump to uh, that specific repository, that's the only file that's there. So now let's go ahead and you know walk through what the GitHub, uh, what the Git workflow will look like directly in Databricks. So what I'm gonna do is jump back to the notebook that I had uh, earlier when I was going through the exploratory data analysis. In here, I'm gonna clone this, basically make a copy of this notebook into my repository. And this is just for the sake of uh, the demo. Of course, once you uh, have cloned a repository, you can create notebooks directly from that menu as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and clone it here. All right, um, so next um, I'm going to uh, create a branch, right? Because right now I'm on my main branch. I want to make sure that I can create like uh, my test branch. I'll go ahead and create that. You can do that directly in Databricks. And you'll notice that you are now in that test branch that was just created. Um, so here in this menu, is where uh, you can select the specific files that were either added, changed, or removed. And so in this particular case, since I had cloned that previous notebook that I created in Databricks into my repository, it's gonna show up that this is a brand new uh, file in this repo. So here, I'm gonna say committing my first file. And in the description, I'm going to uh, add um, committing the exploratory data analysis demo into my test repository, and test, my test repo. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and commit that to the branch. And you'll get the success notification that it was, uh, that it was committed properly. So this is also a neat uh, functionality, but Directly in Databricks, you can create a pull request from here without having to set it up in uh, in, in GitHub directly. So um, Databricks provides this quick link to create that pull request, and it's going to jump directly to an open pull request where it's going to pull in the, the last commit message um, that you had, where it's pre-populating the pull request title to be committing my first file, where the description was what I had entered earlier, emitting the exploratory data analysis demo into the test repo. So here is where uh, you can start to select other users within their team to be added as reviewers. And then finally, you can create the pull request. At this time, um, the 
pull request review process uh, would be underway where the reviewers that you've assigned to your pull request would start to go in, review the changes that you made, add comments directly to those pull requests, or uh, simply just approve it uh, with a message. And so um, since I don't have a reviewer, and this is my private repo where I don't have rules set to prevent me from merging, I have the ability in here to just merge that pull request, which I'm gonna go ahead and do now. So I'm gonna confirm this merge. And then now the uh, my test branch uh, uh, changes have been merged into the main branch. And uh, just as best practice, it's always good to delete your branch so you don't leave any phantom branches hanging. So at this point, you can go back into Databricks and uh, update the repository to go back to the main branch. And when you do, you'll notice that specifically in this particular uh, uh, branch that you've already pulled in, you've pulled down the changes that have come from the previous branch that I had merged. So the exploratory data analysis demo notebook is, is now committed and you are back in your main branch. And this would be um, the process to which you would integrate GitHub, where you would follow Git workflows to create branches, generate pull requests, and to ensure that the repositories in your account are updated with latest changes from all of the other users within the team. Okay. And with that, uh, that concludes uh, the demo of GitHub. And I am going to turn it over to Arif. Thanks, Philip. Let me go ahead and take over the screen. Okay. All right. So let's quickly uh, kind of give an introduction to workflows. So let me just make my screen a little bit bigger for you. There we go. Okay, so first I want to show how you're going to navigate to workflows within Databricks, and then I'll just give you a quick description of what workflows is. Um, so if I'm starting from the home screen in, inside of Databricks, I'll see kind of my main selection menu, which shows me the workspace, the repos, which Philip was just demoing, kind of shows me my recent files. And then finally, I can jump into my data or workflows. So I'm going to go into workflows. Workflows is really a combination of, of two components. The first is jobs, which is what we're going to focus on today. Um, and then the second is Delta Live Tables. So I don't plan to focus on Delta Live Tables today, but just to distinguish between the two, um, I'll mention that Delta Live Tables is kind of purpose built for ETL. Um, so it has, you know, really, you know, kind of purpose built syntax to make it really easy to build out ETL pipelines, does a lot of the dependency management. Uh, does, does a lot of the monitoring outside of the box and also has an optimized engine for ETL. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is the jobs component, which is a little bit more of an all-purpose orchestration tool. So this isn't just for ETL. This isn't just for Spark. It's not just for Databricks, as, as you'll see in just a second. This is more so an, an all-purpose orchestration tool, similar to if some of you are familiar with Airflow, the same way that you would use Airflow is, is, is the way that you would uh, use uh, workflows or, or the jobs component of workflows. So just to quickly jump in, I'll create a job. And I'm going to talk through some of the settings that you see when you first go to create a job. So the first thing that we're going to be prompted to do is just define a task. And we can have different types of tasks. So I'll just call this task one, just as a quick example. Uh, and we can have different types. So commonly we'll see notebooks, um, but we can also run uh, Python scripts, Python wills. We can point to a SQL file. Um, I'm gonna highlight a couple of others that may be relevant either now or in the future. So I mentioned Delta Live Tables. Delta Live Tables can actually be embedded within a workflow. The same thing is true for DBT, um, for JAR files. Spark Submit, some of you may be familiar with Spark Submit jobs that can also be run as part of a workflow. Um, one thing I'll highlight is that when you're using Spark submit jobs, the compute cluster has to be a jobs cluster. And you'll see in a second that that's not always the case. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll note that will show slightly, you know, a different variation of, of compute cluster 
is the SQL files. So in this case, you're gonna see that the compute for a SQL file is a warehouse. So again, when I go into the notebooks, you'll see that there's a little bit more optionality. Whereas when we're running SQL, it would make sense that we're gonna run that specifically on a SQL warehouse. Okay, so now let's just go back to a notebook and let's talk through some of the options. So the first thing that I would do is just point to the notebook. So I'm gonna just browse through my workspace. I could either choose the uh, workspace itself, which is where I would have my user folder or the repos. So if you're using repos as Philip just demoed, you could also select the repo that you wanna pull from. So I'm gonna go to the workspace. I'm gonna go to my user folder. I'm gonna go to a folder that I have here with some tasks defined. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the create tables task. And then the next step, once I define the path of my notebook or my Python file or whatever it is that I'm orchestrating um, in, in this example, a, a notebook, I'm going to then select the compute. Um, so one thing I, I want to highlight, uh, today you won't see serverless compute. Uh, I'm using that while I'm demoing because it's just a little bit quicker. Um, so that will definitely be an option or, or maybe an option for you in the future. Um, but what I want to highlight is, is kind of the way that you all would see the compute, which is the classic jobs compute. Um, so you have a couple of, of options when you create a workflow. Let me just go back one level. Um, we could either go ahead and just add a, go back to the classic jobs compute. So we could either just have a uh, compute, a jobs cluster created for us by default, or we can go into this UI that you just saw when we can specify the specific parameters around the compute cluster that we want to create. Um, one of the things that I'll highlight is this policy. So you can see that I'm, I'm an admin in this account. So my policy is unrestricted. You'll likely have a policy that kind of restricts some of these, uh, some of these uh, different knobs that you see that I'm able to set. So you'll be a little bit more limited in terms of the different parameters that you'll set. Another thing that I, that I want to highlight that I think always, uh, uh, you know, kind of confuses people when they first start working with jobs clusters, uh, especially if you're familiar with Spark clusters in general, is that it only has one parameter for workers. Um, so if you've ever worked with a Spark cluster before, or even take, taken a look at the Spark cluster config, you're used to seeing a min and max value. Uh, in the case of, of jobs clusters, it's expected that you're going to size them uh, to the workload. So it just specifies the number of workers and that number of workers is, is, is fixed. You can specify the worker type, the driver type. Um, again, you'll see that some of these will be pre-filled or some of these will be limited based off of the way that your cluster policy is set up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of there and highlight a couple of other things. Um, I could also specify dependent libraries. So if I'm using a library that if I was working in a notebook on an interactive cluster, I would have to pip install um, or install by any other method, then I can actually specify that as a library dependency. And when I run my job, uh, Workflows is going to go out and it's going to install those libraries on the cluster so that you have them available. So if you're using any sort of import that is referencing a library that's not available by default on the Databricks clusters, uh, then you'll go ahead and, and specify the dependent libraries when you define uh, your job. Another thing that you can do is specify parameters. Um, so you have different types of parameters. You have parameters that you can set and you can kind of manually configure for a specific task. You also have parameters that you can set, as I'll show in a second, at the uh, entire uh, jobs level, which will be shared between tasks. So you can pass those parameters back and forth so you can think about an example, for instance, if you wanted to have the output of one job feed into the input for another job, you're able to do so. Or even if you were running multiple models uh, and you wanted to have a job that then uh, compares uh, some of the performance metrics for all of those models, you could pass in those performance metrics uh, to that last job. Um, emails. Uh, so this is notification that I can set um, on when my job starts, uh, if it's successful and upon failure. Um, there's other notification uh, methods that would need to be configured if you have those available. So for instance, Slack is an, another uh, option as well. Okay, 
Um, and then I can set my timeout and I can set the number of retries uh, that I want uh, for this workflow to attempt to, to try to retry if it, if it fails on the first attempt. So what I'm going to do now is actually jump into a pre-built example. So I'm going to go back one level and I'm going to go ahead and jump into this demo job. And I'm gonna take a look at my task, and then we can kind of just talk through each of these tasks and the configuration that we see here. So a lot of this is what I already explained, the ability to specify the task type, the source, I'm gonna specify the path, the compute type. In this case, I don't have any dependencies, so I don't have any dependent libraries, I don't have any parameters set, and this doesn't depend on any other task. Whereas if we look at task two, it actually depends on task one, right? So we can see that in our DAG visually, but this is how we would specify it inside of our uh, definition or our configuration for the job. So I could also say that it depends on multiple um, tasks to complete. So depending on the flow of your overall uh, job, you're going to want to set the dependencies uh, for each of your tasks. So I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, the other thing that I can show here uh, is an example of a parameter. So here I was just showing, you know, a very trivial example of, of a parameter that I can set to whether or not I want to run that task. So I could set this to yes or no. If it's yes, then I'm going to run that task. If not, then I'm going to skip that task. You can imagine this would be an example maybe if you're going to run the same exact job config in multiple environments, but maybe there's a step that you only run in dev and there's a, a different step that you only run inside of prod. Also what I'll highlight on the parameters if I was going to define a new one is the ability to browse some of these dynamic values. So you could reference the job ID, the job name. I gave the example of only wanting to run in specific environments. So here you can actually uh, specify the environment ID or the environment URL. Um, so that would be an example where maybe you could could implement something like that. Um, and then here I can also specify if I want to run if all of the dependent uh, tasks are completed successfully, if at least one of them are completed successfully, um, or if at least one failed, right? So I can specify under what conditions I want to run the specific task that I'm working with. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and cancel out that. And I'm going to actually go into one other example. So I'm going to clone this. And when I clone this, I'm going to start to mess around with it a little bit. Um, I want to show you one of the examples that I think is, is, is going to be extremely useful, especially if you're running long running jobs. So I'm going to show you how you would monitor these workflows and then how you would uh, potentially repair uh, and troubleshoot if you have any issues. So let me go ahead and kick this off as I'm talking through it. This is probably going to take about a minute for us to start to see the uh, first job actually start to execute. And if I wanna monitor that, I can actually switch from this task tab to my runs tab. Um, so my runs tab is gonna actually show me in real time um, the each of my tasks running. So here I can see that none of the tasks have started up yet. I'm just now starting to uh, start the cluster. Once that cluster starts running, I'll start to see my first task, task one, uh, start to run. While we're waiting for that to run, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, some of the details that we have over here. So I just manually ran this entire job, um, but we can also add triggers. So for instance, I can say that I wanna run this on a specific schedule and I can specify when this should be run, or I can also just specify that this should be run continuously. Um, the schedule is probably most common. I imagine that's what most of you will be doing where you can um, specify cron syntax and you can say, okay, I wanna run this you know, every day at a specific time. Okay, now we can start to look at some of the tasks that are being executed. So I'm actually gonna click on it and I can see in real time, the notebook that is associated with that task, uh, which is a really nice feature. And I can start to see that uh, the, uh, jobs is, is kind of stepping through this notebook. So I could see the output similar to the way that I would be able to see it if I was working from an interactive cluster. Um, so if anything fails, I can start to see that fill in real time. 
And as that one is running, I'm actually gonna go ahead and jump into one of these notebooks. So let me go to task two, and I'm gonna show you how you can jump into the notebook and start to edit it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click open the notebook that is associated with that task, and I'm gonna mess something up. So I'm just gonna put error, which isn't a, a, a variable, so it's not defined. It should cause this to break. And I'm gonna kick off another, uh, another uh, job run so that we can see what happens when this breaks. So if I go back here, I'm gonna go ahead and kick off another manual job run. And we're gonna expect that that one is gonna break. In the meantime, we can jump back to the run that is currently executing. And we can see that it's stepping through each of these tasks. We can take a look at the duration, the start time, the end time. Here's another place where it's gonna show me the details around the notebook, the status, et cetera. Um, and then we're gonna wait for this second one to start back up. Oh, let's make sure that that one actually is. So this one actually failed, right? So what we're gonna wanna do is if we have a task like this that fails, and let me see one thing, this one was skipped. So I'm gonna start it again because I don't want it to skip. I want it to fail on that specific session. So this is just gonna rerun everything and hopefully we can get it to run. And then I want it to fail on a specific step so that we can show how we can start from a specific step and then start to uh, repair any issues that we have with our job at a specific step and go from there. So let's go back to our runs. Oh, so that's a good example where I set the max concurrent runs to one. So this is why this originally was skipped because my max concurrent runs uh, was set to one and my first run was still running, it automatically skipped this one. So if I go back, I can now kick off a second run because that one is completed. So now I can view that run and this is the one that we want to go ahead and fill so that we can see how we can start to uh, step through. And again, this one is going to go ahead and bring up the compute takes about a minute to bring up the compute. Once it brings up the compute, we can start to see that it's gonna step through the task. And what we expect is I believe it's task three where we modify the notebook. So we're gonna expect that it's gonna fail on that task. Um, and this is a use case where, again, let's say each of the tasks, each of these notebooks is running for hours or multiple hours um, and one fails, right? Um, what you used to have to do is you had to go back, you had to troubleshoot, what caused the error, you have to fix it, and then you have to start all the way from the beginning and run everything again. Um, so you now have this really, really cool feature where you can go ahead and say, okay, if task three is the one that failed, I'm gonna go to task three specifically. I'm gonna see what my error was. I'm gonna try to fix that error in task three. And then once I fix the error in task three, I'm gonna rerun this and I'm gonna kind of pick up where I left off. So here we can see a stepping through where, uh, running through task one, then we should move on to task two, two and then we want to take a look at, at task three and see if it, it fails again. As we're doing that, let me just bring up one other screen and kind of show this uh, main uh, UI when we first enter into this. I kind of glossed over this when we first jumped in. Um, there's a couple of, of things that you'll kind of just want to take note of here. One is the ability to switch views. Um, so if you ever jump in here and you have a, a, a job that's been shared with you and you don't see it, you want to make sure that you're actually looking at all of the jobs that are accessible to you and not just the ones that are owned by you. So you can kind of quickly filter through those. You can also search through jobs. Um, so, you know, if I wanted to search through, you know, any job that has demo, I can see the different jobs that have the word demo in it. I can see that across the jobs that are owned by me as well as the jobs uh, that are uh, accessible by me. I can also specify the columns that I wanna see here as well. So let's say I was looking for a specific job by ID, I could specify those columns, I could specify tasks, or even if I was looking for a job by cluster. Let's jump back and see if our uh, last run failed. It did, so we're gonna take a look at it. We're gonna say, okay, this run, this run failed. We need to try to fix it. I can see that it actually failed on task two. And then all of the dependencies for task two, all of the downstream dependencies are also failing. 
So if I go to task two, I can bring open that notebook again. We can see the error that I added. So I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna say, let me go ahead and repair the run. So now what we want to happen is that it's not starting from task one. Task one already succeeded, task four already succeeded, task three is starting directly from task two. So it's gonna to try to rerun task two and then it's gonna to try to rerun all of the downstream dependencies. Um, so again, very efficient way to, to kind of be able to troubleshoot without wasting a ton of compute on a job uh, that started and, and failed after an hour or two hours or so. Okay, um, as that's running, we're gonna jump back and forth to make sure we're, we're kind of making the most use of time. So I'm gonna jump back into the UI. So let me go back to workflows here and I'm gonna bring up the ones that are owned by me. I'm gonna bring back up my uh, clean example. I'm gonna take a look at my task um, and I'm gonna just highlight a couple other things inside of the UI that we haven't showed. Uh, in fact, one thing that I probably should highlight, especially because we're kind of coming on the wheel of the, the Git session, uh, is the ability to actually be able to point uh, to a Git repository. So here I'm pointing to a notebook that could either be in the workspace or it could be inside of my Git provider. So I could just point to a Git repository, assuming that I have my credentials configured. I could do the same thing for really anything that's supported in Git. So I could do the same thing for a Python script as well. Let's go back and see if our run is now succeeding. So we can see task two is, is running. We can see that it's starting to step through. We're running the first command. So if we get through that first command, we would expect that everything else is gonna run successfully. And then all of the downstream jobs should run successfully as well. Notice that this is the same kind of uh, monitoring uh, row. So it doesn't actually start a new job. This is the same job. So it's gonna go from the failure that we saw previously, and it's just gonna update the status. So previously task two failed, but now it's just showing that task two succeeded and it's showing me all of the downstream tasks. Okay, so with that, I think we can wrap up and see if we have any questions about this. Obviously a really important feature workflows is, is kind of how you start to uh, you know, put some of the work that you're you're going to want to put into production. So once you do some of your, you know, ad hoc development inside of an interactive notebook, and you say, I now want to, you know, go ahead and schedule that notebook as a job um, so that I can run it on some, you know, specified schedule. Um, so this is definitely going to be an important feature that I'm sure you're all going to leverage. Last thing that I'll I'll highlight about workflows. Um, is you want to take advantage of jobs compute when you can. So sometimes what we see is the tendency to actually go ahead and, and run a notebook manually every day. Um, so you're treating it as a job, but you're running it manually every day, or you're running it from an interactive cluster. And that tends to be a very ineffic inefficient way to, to use Databricks because you actually are charged less uh, for running as a job. Um, so whenever you can, if you have something that is repeatable and you have something that you want to use over and over again and you want to run on a schedule, you're going to want to make sure that you're leveraging jobs to do so in jobs clusters. All right, so I'll go ahead and, and hand it back to you, Rachel, to see if we have any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Arif. Um, not seeing that many questions in the chat. We did have one. Um, Philip, I, I know you went over the Git integration. Um, someone asked, what are common issues, if any, with the Git integration that we should be aware of? Um, so one thing to key is, um, one thing to look out for is that, you know, if your token was working one day and then everything was fine, and then like maybe a couple of weeks later, it isn't working, um, you may want to check the uh, uh, whether or not that token is valid. So if you recall, as part of my demo, when you had set up the token, there, it defaulted to only be live for about 30 days. So it's gonna be really easy for you to forget that. Uh, on the 31st day of using that token, it likely won't be able to, you won't, you won't be able to connect or run any operations on that remote repository. 
So you'll need to generate a new token and uh, upload into Databricks as a result. Great, thank you. So far, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat, but I did want to revisit in one of our other deep dive sessions, we had a couple more questions that we weren't able to get to. So I'm thinking let's hop back to those. But again, um, for those on the call, if you have any questions about the session we had here um, recently, feel free to put those in the chat while we address these other three that we missed. So um, one question was, can you build a dashboard from several separate queries, or is it each dashboard only tied to one query? Yep, and, and I think Lindsay took this one in the chat, but absolutely, in fact, the example that Lindsay showed uh, was a dashboard that was built off of multiple queries. So yes, you can combine multiple queries, multiple visualizations, uh, and add each of those to a dashboard. Great. And you, yeah, you answered my next question, Arif, too, because someone asked if it was possible to add together visualizations based on different tables. So you got that answered as well. So thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And then the other question that I had was, is it possible to speak briefly to the data profiling capability of Databricks? I found it to be an extremely powerful ability that I foresee many data scientists utilizing when performing exploratory data analysis. Yep, so that was exactly the demo that followed up afterwards. Um, so I think that question came in the session prior to that, but that was one of the things that I covered. And perhaps one uh, additional uh, point that I'd like to add is that you know, for data profiling, it's, in, it's a useful tool to be able to look at you know, how your data is distributed and see if there's any issues or gaps. Um, but beyond that, it's like it's also useful to have that saved. And so something that I didn't show earlier is that once you get to that data profile menu, you also have the ability to save it as well. I think uh, it's exportable. Great. And we did get another question come through. Um, it, it's revolving around the popular section within the landing page. How does something go under popular or not go under popular in that landing page? Do you guys have more guidance on that? Yep, absolutely. So that's that's a new feature that Databricks added to try to save users time. Um, so if we see that you know everyone who's leveraging the platform is hitting against the same dashboard or the same notebook um, or the same query, then we'll add it to that popular section just to make it a little bit easier to access. Um, so that as soon as you come into that landing page, you quickly can see some of the resources that are being leveraged, but even use it as somewhat of a, a discoverability tool. Um, so you can kind of see, uh, 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 of course, assuming that these resources are shared, um, you can see what some of your colleagues are, are leveraging very often, uh, and you can quickly kind of navigate to those. The same is true for recents, which is why both of those pop up. I know I used to use uh, recents all the time and it used to kind of be hidden right so i always wanted to go back to to a notebook that i was working on yesterday or two days ago so now those two just show up right directly in the ui to make it a little bit easier to navigate and to clarify on, on what you just said i think the most important takeaway too is uh, you won't be seeing popular items that you don't have access to it's mm -hmm. only going to include in that list things that you uh can access yourself because you have the privileges to do so Okay, yeah. great. Because yeah, there's a follow up question: If popular is publicly visible across all users, is there any permission to be set by the user to make something popular visible to the entire community? Yep. So this will just follow Databricks access controls. Um, so if if you don't have access to a resource, you're not going to be able to see it there. So so it's not. I guess the question there is: Is it set specifically on that? Uh, kind of landing page. Instead, it's set at the resource level or the object level where uh, you can set permissions on each of those objects and determine whether or not uh, users have access to it. Okay, and then just to um, ask one more clarifying question, is everything underneath popular publicly available or just, um, yeah, is it is it publicly available to everyone? No, it's, it's okay. still subject to access controls, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. And with that, I'm not seeing any other questions. So at this point, I'm going to hand things over to um, Amy Tam from CMS, provide us some closing thoughts. But Philip and Arif, thank you so much for this 
last Data Bricks deep dive session. I know that was very informative. So um, thank you, Rachel, and everyone that came together to put the past two days together for Data Camp. There were a lot of information shared. Um, I hope you guys got a lot out of this and you are excited with the new tools and new features to come. If you haven't had a chance to complete the satisfaction surveys, there will be a link out to your inbox shortly. So please take a moment to complete it. Your feedback is very valuable to us to help make improvements, uh, create new trainings, and to make data and analytics uh, successful for you all. So on behalf of CMS, I would like to thank you all for joining. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. And I'll echo that as well. Thank you everyone for joining us. Again, all of the questions submitted to, during today and yesterday's um, event will be answered and posted on our end user site. Also, all the recordings will be made available shortly also on Confluence. So thank you again.